Um, Siddhartha, or Sid actually, is a very distinguished machine learning engineer. He actually did his thesis at Uni Zürich um, a couple of years ago. Already then, it was several dozens of pages long of mathematical formulas. I, I actually downloaded it once, but I could not get over page number three, I think. It's really difficult to read, so I don't suggest to read it. But um, more than that, you are a very uh, gifted programmer and actually a great enthusiast about open source software. And that's what actually makes you also very much welcome in our um, community. And so there, uh, today you will um, introduce us to open source and machine learning. Actually, I didn't see the slides, so, but I, I saw you presenting this year several times and you always, always did a great job. Just um, your background, you worked at several companies. Um, one I can remember is NVIDIA. You were machine learning in, in the GPU um, area. And uh, the, the, uh, the job you had before was at Alterian, an open source drone software developing company, very successful. And now you have a new position. Um, you're at the at the Cyber Peace Institute and doing not just open source and machine learning, but also for the good. And that's even more um, a great opportunity to have you here. So very, very warm welcome to Siddhartha Singh. The stage is yours. Uh, thanks a lot, Matthias. Uh, the introduction was a bit too generous. Uh, I, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. You know, open source is one of those um, parts of software development, which uh, I mean, just about everyone in my community, you know, the machine learning community realizes how important it is. So today, you know, I thought I would just shortly speak, you know, 20 minutes about how machine learning community has contributed to the rise and the, uh, the interest in machine learning that is happening. And without the open source community, where we are in machine learning and all the hype you hear would absolutely not be possible. Um, so, but you know, and I'll come to uh, sort of specifics. Um, how do I change the slides, Matthias? Oh yeah, now I see. Um, so just before, you know, some, some background, as Matthias said, I mean, I have worked for many different companies uh, over the last years. My current position is at the Cyber Peace Institute. I mean, it is a nonprofit organization. Um, I work with cyber criminal organizations, not with them, but uh, trying to find, you know, who they are targeting, why are they targeting, trying to find patterns, malware, you know, all that sort of stuff. I'm a machine learning engineer, data scientist there. Uh, before this, I was a Tortarian, as Matthias said. Uh, we, uh, that is an open source drone company. So based on PX4, which is the largest open source software for autonomous drones. Uh, and uh, the guy who originally wrote the PX4 is the founder of this particular company. So I was working with him for a while. And I have worked for um, other companies like Ojo, iSize, NVIDIA. So as you see, a lot of the work that I have done over the last years is really in startups. Um, and working for startups, you know, in the last years, sort of, sort of, there is a bit of realization that comes to you, you know. Um, you hear this, this word, this is a buzzword you hear quite a bit, you know, uh, AI first. Uh, AI first is this, is this startup, is this company where, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning is at the center of the and it doesn't matter what they do you know on the out um, what product they are um, uh, launching uh, making developing uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is at the core of it that is how they define AI first um, what I would like to argue uh, is that the, ex the whole existence of AI first, companies, you know, particularly startups that you see around, if you go around Zurich, where I live, um, it is full of companies like these. Um, and I would like to argue that this would not be possible uh, without the open source community all around the world. Um, 
contributing um, their time and effort. Uh, you, you hear quite a bit, you know, there is this word you hear quite a bit in startups, particularly if any one of you is familiar with Silicon Valley culture. The word is disruption. You know, this, is this, this is this word you hear quite often. Um, and, uh, and you have, you know, companies like Uber and Airbnb, and they use machine learning really effectively. Um, or, or, or even, you know, bigger companies like Google and Facebook, of course. Um, and none of this really, I mean, the critical infrastructure, you know, in the background that is required for these startups and these companies to function uh, is based on open source in almost most its entirety. Um, and uh, this is something, you know, that people over the last decade um, have contributed their time, their resources, and all for free. Um, and this is, you know, and if you go to one of these um, <clears throat> startup companies, except for Instagram, I don't know after Facebook bought it, I don't know the current status, but it used to be like this, except for Instagram, not a single company that I know of actually acknowledges the list of open source softwares, open source libraries that they actually use in making what they are actually making. Uh, so that is sort of, you know, this is this hidden um, effort by thousands and thousands of people, you know, all around the world uh, that has resulted in another term that Silicon Valley tries, uh, uses quite a bit is unicorns. You, know? um, you have Uber and, you know, Airbnb is readying its IPO. It's going to happen in any coming months. Uh, and this is sort of uh, my little uh, sort of just an argument that um, I think we need to acknowledge uh, the role of the open source community much more than actually we do. Uh, these days, you will also see all the big tech companies, but you know, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, the big five, right? They tend to open source just about everything, uh, at least when it comes to machine learning work. Because they realize that, you know, it doesn't matter how much talent they can buy, how much they can pay, they just don't have enough to develop and reach the goals that they want with machine learning and AI uh, in the coming future. So it is absolutely essential for them. It is almost that they are forced to do this. In the later uh, part of the talk, I will talk about how, although they pledge openness, there are still caveats to this. You know, I will flag those caveats um, as well. But this is something that I wanted uh, to start by sort of introducing this particular idea that this is how it really is. The backbone really is open source. Um, so I, you know, I use the word critical infrastructure before, and I think I want to, before I, I'll come to the machine learning specific uh things uh but before i move on to that the critical infrastructure bit i think i want to explain that a bit more of what i mean by critical infrastructure um and this is you know the question always comes of why support open source at all um and one of the prime examples in my judgment is this idea uh this particular zero day vulnerability that happened was discovered on april 9th 2014 by two independent researchers, um, which came to be known as Heartbleed. This was a vulnerability in this particular software called OpenSSL. So if any one of you have ever used any website and has seen the URL of the website, and it starts with HTTPS, the S in HTTPS really about two thirds of that particular encryption actually is done using this toolkit called OpenSSL. Uh, and, uh, and then this major vulnerability was discovered in April of uh, 2014. Uh, fortunately, by independent researchers and not by, you know, a criminal group. Um, and, you know, when researchers started looking into why such a major vulnerability happened in a software that was being used 
to secure messages of not just you know what you and i communicate with but rather the biggest banks in the world you know are actually using the software to secure your communication when you are communicating with the bank and uh, this is the same software being used when you are actually putting your credit card number to pay online you know for something that you just purchased on amazon or you know other uh, e-commerce websites so something so essential how could it happen that such a major vulnerability was discovered you know so late it turned out this was present for a long time um and then you know it was discovered that such a major software actually was being maintained by a full time employee of one of all in open ssl in 2014 the whole thing was maintained by one person full time employee um and that was a bit you know the community was taken aback a bit that everybody was using it nobody was contributing to it and so when i say critical infrastructure that all these startups all the big banks everyone relies on this is this is the level of criticality that i mean fortunately you know after that was discovered the situation with open ssl um is is much better now they have a large uh, a lot of funding um you know they can hire employees now and so but you know we cannot wait for another hard bleed level vulnerability to be discovered in some major open source software that is being used um in the internet as we know it um uh next time it might be discovered by some criminal uh, gang so that's why we need to support open source um this is not you know something that you can this is not just charity if you know if people uh, think like that this is something essential to the internet as we use it every day so now i just want to um talk a bit about open source and machine learning um this is uh, something very interesting to me um so you know in 2012 uh it's this is a popular uh, narrative that you will hear if you talk to any you know machine learning researcher or any machine learning practitioner practitioner that why do you think machine learning is so big suddenly and they will always tell you that two things actually happened in 2012 um two things merged uh pretty well one was the availability of very very large data sets that we had been you know 2008 2009 if you remember big data used to be such a big buzz world you know at that moment so eventually the buzz died out however the data remained you know and so the, there was a availability of a lot of data internet of things was really coming online in that moment we were collecting a lot of data on a lot of things and the computational power became cheap enough that you and i could simply just start using it in our homes you know on our local machines and so on so this is a popular narrative you will hear uh, however there is a third thing to this that just about gets missed every time which is um the availability of the open source software uh the open source community uh had been developing uh you know sort of just because that was you know something they just like to do developing different tools and it turned out this was very useful um so that's why you will you will you kind of also notice that certain programming languages like python became the programming language of choice it was not just because of the ease of use you know that was one of the major reasons the other big reason was um uh that you know it had a huge community that actually supported it and there was a, already an availability of a of major you know libraries in in uh, in python developed by open source community for machine learning uh and so that sort of became you know um also so the open source community guided quite a lot of the direction in which um the machine learning went in the last decade uh some things are changing now because you know we have discovered certain issues with things like python but uh, uh but that's one of the other reasons why there was an exponential rise of uh, so you you know so you might have you know these are some of the tools that i have listed which are like the most popular even people who don't actually work in machine learning have actually heard of these libraries these libraries these open source libraries they are so popular you know like tensorflow and pytorch these are um scikit learn used to exist a decade before tensorflow you know it's a major machine learning library for python 
you have new tools like Kubeflow, which are changing how we actually think about uh, deploying and maintaining, you know, machine learning lifecycle. This is all open source. Kubeflow is based on Kubernetes, and Kubernetes in itself is an open source tool uh, for deploying and scaling any sort of system. Uh, and uh, Kubernetes single-handedly has changed how we think about how you know backend deployment uh, systems of any sort of software should be. You know, you have other open source tools that I have not listed here, like Docker. You know, uh, completely open source. Um, how you know deals with so much problems of reproducibility we had earlier, um, and you have some new state of the art stuff like Jax in Python. You know, um, kind of inspired by the issues in machine learning that we actually have. Uh, and of course, Jupyter Notebooks and things like that. So there is like a lot of work going on in this, and just about everything is open source uh, in the machine for, on the machine learning side. Um, and at least which is the stuff that is not are slowly being open source because everyone is realizing that you just cannot achieve this on your own. Uh, the goals of machine learning on your own at all. Uh, but I would say that so the future of machine learning and open source is not just in the um, in in tooling, right? We're not just open source community is not just there to provide tooling. Uh, the the contribution is actually has to be much deeper in the future as I see it. And one of the main things that we or problems that we have in machine learning at the moment is the is the idea of trust in AI in machine learning models. You know. Um, you will see, you know, when the COVID Tracer app was being released, uh, was released like what, a few months ago, um, a lot of people actually used it. And, you know, th three things in my judgment sort of came together why people trusted such apps at all was that there was government, there was big tech, but there was an open source um, uh, community associated with it. All these apps were actually open source. Um, and so there was a stamp of approval by the open source community who actually checked the security, who actually checked whether, you know, you were being tracked everywhere, you know, and what was the nature of tracking and so on. And uh, that puts trust into a certain system. And that is the kind of trust we require in AI models, you know, when to, now AI is being deployed in the wild everywhere, you know, uh, there are things that you use today which you don't even know is actually uh, a little machine learning model app working in the background. Uh, and this new modern machine learning, the deep learning system that is say, are really black boxes. And tomorrow when, you know, these things start driving your cars, uh, the kind of trust we require, you know, before we are able to kind of, you know, uh, say that yeah, it's fine, the decisions they are making will require, you know, things like bias and fairness and privacy. Um, these things have to be solved, resolved. So that's sort of I see that the the open source community and ML community. This is not the end. This is uh, is the relationship is much deeper. Um, and finally, I just want to sort of you know uh, talk a bit about open source and money because the relationship is very complicated here. Uh, and uh, particularly from the context of machine learning, I will just uh, leave you with this slide. Um, you know, as much as the big companies that you hear, you know, Google has just open source TensorFlow and, and Facebook is making PyTorch and there's like a lot of these things. Um, these companies are not as benevolent as people tend to think. So this is a little caveat that everyone must keep in mind um, uh, of what these particular companies, how they actually work. Uh, if you look at the, I, I saw the statistics on patents that these companies are filing in mach on machine learning system. It has quadrupled or something, you know, uh, triple quadrupled in the last year. Um, these are machine learning specific uh, patents. Google, in fact, has tried to patent fundamental concepts in neural networks, you know, like dropout and batch normalization. These are fundamental layers we use to, you know, tune uh, our network or regularize our network. Um, and you, I mean, particularly, uh, and Amazon is one of the prime examples of how it, uh, Amazon is actually hurting open source companies. What they tend to do is you have these Apache 2.0 licenses, right? Which are completely open licenses to do whatever you want with it. Companies like Amazon would kind of fork 
um, you know, things like uh, MongoDB, Redis Labs, you know, Redis databases, and make its own version and put it into Amazon systems. And what that results is an open source businesses, which are based on uh, like MongoDB has, of course, the open source version, but they also have, you know, to make money, what they do is they have, they host it on their own cloud systems. Um, and that's how they fund all their open source work actually. And they are completely endangered by how Amazon behaves. And you will notice that companies like Elastic, MongoDB, Redis Labs, they have all changed their licenses in the last year, all of them. And the license changes are in a way that it is specifically targeted to cloud providers like Amazon and Google um, and Microsoft. Uh, OpenAI, the, probably one of the most famous, you know, uh, uh, AI companies started by Elon Musk, changed its business model from non-profit to a capital corporate uh, in the last year. Um, this happened, I think, two years ago or maybe last year. So there is, you know, there is a lot of pledge of openness, but at the same time, there are things happening in the background that one must be aware of. And these are some of the things that I wanted to flag today. Um, and I leave you with this and I thank you again for actually having me.